Hare Krishna. So welcome to the Sunday program today. And I will speak today on the topic of thinking about thinking. How our thoughts can help or harm us. So I will speak this in three parts. And after each part you can have some reflection or question. So first is that our thoughts are not necessarily the way things are or who we are. So thoughts are not the way things are, nor thoughts are not the way we are. Second is <coughs> training ourselves to check our thoughts. And third part I'll talk about training ourselves to change our thoughts. So now <coughs> many people like to read some adventure fiction, some mystery novels or watch some movies. Because something which is unknown, you try to discover it, understand it. That's very exciting. Now, all this is good. Actually, if we look at it objectively, we are ourselves a big mystery to ourselves. Because if we, if we look at ourselves, even just one day we can look at ourselves, there are so many times when we, we get emotions that we didn't expect. We, we act in ways that we didn't want to act. So our own actions and our own responses can be quite a mystery at times, if we look at it. Sometimes we just get caught in meeting with the consequences of who we are rather than understanding who we are. That is, I got angry with someone and then that person felt hurt and then I had to patch, patch things up and I do that. But so we get caught in dealing with the consequences of who we are rather than comprehending who we are. So our thoughts can come. Sometimes we can feel very nasty, get some nasty thoughts about others. Sometimes we may just feel um, very, very negative or infuriated with others. We can get all kinds of thoughts. Sometimes we can get wonderful thoughts also. So we can't see each other's thoughts and that is a great blessing <laughs> if you could see each other's thoughts not a single relationship could be sustained oh you think like this about me this is the kind of desires you have this is the kind of person you are we would judge each other so terrible and we would, we would not be able to sustain anything so nature has given us a buffer by which we can't see each other's thoughts so what exactly are thoughts? Where do they come from? So the Bhagavad Gita gives us a three level model of the self. And this metaphor is what I will use throughout the class to understand how to, how to think about thinking in an effective way. So thinking is something which you are always doing. And thoughts are coming, we are thinking about them, we are acting and the actions that happen, we think about them. But we don't think about thinking itself. So to try to do that, let's understand this three-level model of the self. Say so the Bhagavad Gita says that we are we are souls who are different from our minds. So the mind and the soul are both we could say inside. And the difference between the two at one level is that. The soul is the root of consciousness, R -O, o T. And the mind is the route of consciousness, R O U T. It is the path through which consciousness comes into the world. So you could imagine, say, a, a high security building in which there are, say, five doors from which people may come in or go out. And there is a control room, main security room, where Cameras from all the five doors are streaming. And there's a big screen with five windows. And on these windows, there is uh, observing these windows is the security in charge. So that big screen with multiple windows is like the mind. And we who are observing are the soul. So when we become con so the secure person in charge of security, they can't be there at all the five doors personally. 
but they are conscious how are they conscious through the route the route for their consciousness is the the screen and the connection of that screen with the door through the camera and the circuitry so similarly right now say you are sitting and you are hearing so on your screen you consider your inner screen to be the mind on that screen say what i am the say the primarily you could see the sound and the sight windows are active and through the sound and sight windows you are see you are seeing you are hearing and you are trying to make sense of things so all these windows are open but sometimes we minimize some windows sometimes we maximize some windows so if you have a big screen even two windows can be big sometimes one window can consume the whole screen sometimes two windows can be big sometimes all four five windows can be small 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 so similarly say right now you are hearing and you hear the sound of the door opening behind you now there is a small window that is there it's not a extraordinary sound so okay you keep it small but if suddenly you hear a big scream over there then immediately that will not just that window will maximize and full fill your screen look what happened isn't it so constantly on this inner screen there are various things that are getting depicted and we are meant to be the observer of all this and then we process we of course are not is observer but also the processor <coughs> but this is much more complicated because along with these five windows what do the five windows refer to can anyone guess senses senses five senses yes correct so we get knowledge from the eyes the ears the smell the touch and through our tongue so our taste so we get information from all these five senses but along with these five windows there are also many many more windows which can open up and these are the windows of imagination if something is not there we can imagine all of us have the capacity to imagine we may all imagine to different degrees of vividness but we can imagine things and thus sometimes we may get caught in our head or we get lost in our thoughts now when you are say sometimes you are talking with someone and then that person we can see their eyes getting glazing over and say earth to you earth to you to which planet have you gone to now is it it <laughs> that is the idea so they will get lost in their head that means what has happened while we are in front of them the sound and the sight windows have become minimized and some window of some thought which they might recollect from the past which might grow that has grown and completely consumed so we can get lost in our our thoughts also now so now if we consider it this way and we could say that there is the we could say there is the inner seer there is the inner screen and there is the outer scene the inner seer is who soul, soul. the inner screen is mind. the mind and the outer scene is the body the physical reality around us so outer scene is what we are seeing right now so now the soul cannot directly connect with the outer scene whatever is the outer scene has to be projected on the inner screen And and the soul, as the inner seer, sees that. So I talked about how there is perception from outside, which comes as a window. Then there is imagination from inside. Mm -hmm. But often when we perceive things, it's much more complicated. It's not simply perception. It's not simply imagination. It's actually within us. All that we have thought or experienced in the past. get stored as impressions and when they are stored as impressions anything that we perceive it's actually a combination of the present perception and the past impression that is there so that's why we don't see things as they are we always see things as they are interpreted by our mind's impressions so for example if we see say a person from a particular community and our impression is these people are very stingy so then as soon as we see that person we start thinking it must be very stingy person so now what has happened that person has not done anything which indicates stinginess but 
So our thoughts are not just a result of perception. They're not just a result of, so I talked about imagination. Imagination is also a result of impressions. Whatever impressions we have, based on those we imagine. So when we get thoughts, our thoughts are not necessarily the way things are. Now that person might not be at all stingy. But because of our impression, we think people in this group, they're always stingy. Mm -hmm. So our thoughts are not necessarily the way things are. Nor are our thoughts are not necessarily the way we are. That means we, the thought might come, this person might be very stingy. But we may not actually be very judgmental people who just put labels on people. Just the thought has come over there. So if we consider this inner screen on which many things keep popping up. Mm. Say if you're, a, a, to get an understanding of this, say if you're connected to some website, which is say a news website with a lot of advertisements on it. Now we are reading one thing on that website, but many other things are popping up over there. And sometimes some Google puts some ads, sometimes those website itself has some ads. And see, normally there's a big difference between book reading and site reading. See in book reading, if the reader is, is sent somewhere else, that's a deficiency on the part of, part of the author. Okay, they should get the author to read. But on a site, if the reader is sent somewhere else, that's an additional click for the site. <laughs> so distraction online is actually a strength not a weakness not for us but for the site designers so when if you consider that on we are we are reading something on that page but along with that there are many links that are there and those links sometimes may go, grow in size sometimes they become small in size sometimes may change on their own Sometimes you have a slider which is a different uh, additional links keep coming over there. So like that, in our minds, there are, we may be focusing on one thing, but along with that, many other things are going on. So when a particular thought pops up in our mind, it's like a particular window opens up. So when that window opens up, our thoughts are need, not necessarily the way things are. There might be nothing outside out there because of which that thought is coming. And we might be getting a very, we might get a very envious thought, we might get a very angry thought, we might get a very lusty thought. But that might not be the way we are also. It is just that that particular thought has popped up on our inner screen. So what are our thoughts? If you consider this thing, our thoughts are simply streams of words or streams of image, images on our inner screen. Our thoughts are what? Simply streams of words or streams of images. See, different people think differently. Some people are more visual thinkers. Some people are more verbal thinkers. So our thoughts are simply streams of stimuli on our inner screen. And now this stream of stimuli might be related with the world out there. And that might be related to who we are also, but not necessarily. Sometimes, a thing, sometimes we say we see something, it looks like a snake, and we become fearful. And then we find out it's not a snake, it's simply a rope. So when we got that image over there, that is not the way things are. So our thoughts, our thought, the thought of, oh, this is a dangerous snake, it might bite me, I might die. That thought is not the way things are. But by association, the particular thought comes up within us. So Krishna tells in the Bhagavad Gita that, learn to become an observer of your thoughts. Prakasham cha pravrittim cha moham eva cha pandava na dveshti sam pravrittani na nivrittani kaangshati udasi na vadasi nam gunairyo na vichalyate Krishna says that these thoughts will arise because of the kind of impressions that are there within you in the past. And when they come, don't get carried away by them. Don't get attracted to them. Don't get repelled by them. Just observe them. So our thoughts are simply streams of stimuli going through our inner screen. And 
depending on which stream we focus on just like going back to the example of the links whichever window we focus on it will maximize whichever link we click that will maximize that will open up so um, i was in america in a university so they are developing artificial intelligence systems over there that's a big field most in most uh, universities so what they are trying to develop is that if a person is watching a tv or watching or reading something on a computer they are they are developing sensors on the screen of the computer which can sense say uh, where the person's eyes are say somebody is watching one youtube video and say there is one youtube video over here and there are maybe related videos that smiling on the right side so if they they can notice if a person's if a person's eyes say stay on another video for say 5 seconds you can adjust that setting then if it stays on that for 1 second 5 seconds or half a second depending or uh, what 10 seconds 30 seconds whatever based on that then that video will open up automatically you don't have to click on it also you just give attention to it it will open up so they are trying to develop that technology but that technology is already there inside us <laughs> our thoughts are like that so there are many things going on right now we are aware of some things say we you uh, now anything that we give attention to it starts growing it starts growing 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 and this is at one level a functional necessity but at another level it can also be a functional impediment see functional necessity if you are driving along a road and suddenly we see some person suddenly walking trying jay walking oh i have to press the brakes so being aware of what else, what are, what other stimuli are there along with our focus that is important so in some cases it is a functional necessity that whatever we give our attention to that occupies our consciousness but in today's world where there are so many distractions coming up sometimes we might un unintentionally give our attention to something and it just consume our consciousness and when it consumes our consciousness then we can't uh, then we get carried away by that so say one example of this could be say for us say when when say when somebody becomes insane now what is insanity people still have consciousness insane people are also conscious but for this, this is a any kind of insanity is a, a complicated subject but in simple terms what is happening when people take their inner screen so seriously that they become oblivious of the outer scene then that is when we consider the person insane that means they have certain impressions based on that they have certain conceptions and they are not connected with reality at all mm -hmm. so when that happens then they are considered insane mm -hmm. <coughs> so once it is said that the prime minister of india a former prime minister of india he went to a pandit nehru he went to a mental asylum and I was talking with there was one person who was dressed like a very nice gentlemanly kind of person so he went and talk with him introduced himself he says i am pandit nehru the prime minister of india and person just tapped him consoling me on the shoulder he said when i came here i was also saying the same thing <laughs> <laughs> so now <coughs> we all get caught in our inner screen at times but if we get caught for too long way way too long then it can become a problem as like sometimes say now the cricket season is coming up so young people can get captivated with cricket and you may see especially in india we may see young young men are walking along the road and suddenly they are moving their hands or they are batting now there is no bat there is no ball there is no cricket cricket field but it's all there in their mind and they are not so caught in that that not only are they lost they are also physically enacting it so so what has happened when the thought world when the inner screen becomes disconnected with the outer scene then it becomes very dangerous it it goes towards destructive directions 
So now when a person becomes uh, suicidal, now everybody has problems in life. Of course, there are degrees of problems and some people have far more problems than others. But everybody has problems. Nobody has it easy in the world. But when it's not, mostly it's, you could say, two different people, they may have the same magnitude of problems. But one person becomes suicidal, other person doesn't become suicidal. So it's not just the problems that make people suicidal. It is that, okay, the problems are there, and they're on their inner screen, some negative movie starts playing. No, you are worthless, your life is useless, you are simply a burden. You, you will never be able to do anything in life. You are better dead than alive. So the inner screen is not just some theoretical conceptual matter. The inner screen can even kill people. What is played on the inner screen, if it is taken too seriously, if it is not processed, it can even end up killing the person. So basically what happens? The mind, the Bhagavad Gita says, is the enemy. The Krishna says that, Bandhur Atma Atmanas Tasya Yenat Mahim Atmana Jita Anatmanas Tu Shatrutve Vartet Atma Yiva Shatruvat Since if the mind is not controlled, it can be an enemy. It can be our worst enemy. So now the mind is the enemy, not just of the soul, the mind can be the enemy even of the body. Where the mind can even cause the body, can kill the body basically. Or rather cause the soul to kill the, destroy the body. So this whole concept of the inner screen is understanding it is a, is a very consequential matter. So our thoughts, what are, uh, they are what plays out on the inner screen. They can be series of images, series of words, basically a series of stimuli playing out on the inner screen. And if we take them very seriously, without seeing their connection with the reality of the physical scene, then we might get lost in our thoughts. That can lead to insanity, that can even lead to suicide. So this was the first point I was going to make. That our thoughts are not necessarily the way things are or the way we are. Our thoughts are simply streams of images or words going on on our inner screen. Any questions or comments about this? Yes, Charwanda. Uh, can I come to that a little later? I'm going to talk about it. So, yeah, so it's not that. Uh, okay, I'll come to that. Yeah? You know, mind, we can say, is placed here in the brain, and mind can run through the whole body. So, where does the soul stay in the body, and does it run all through the body? Okay. So, where does the soul stay in the body? The soul is non physical. So, it's, you can't really point out to a physical location for a non-physical entity. You could say, say, for example, where is the user in the computer? Well, the user is a different category of existence on the computer. So the, now you could say the user's fingers are on the keyboard right now. Or the user's hands are on the screen, they're moving it up and down. But the user is a different category of existence. So, the, so we cannot give a physical location to the user. But we could say, okay, if somebody is uh, primarily playing a video game where there is a trackpad by which you cause the things to move, then the primary locus of interaction between the user and the video game will be the trackpad. So the soul is not present anywhere in the body. The soul is different. Soul's, soul is a different category of existence. Because it is non-material, you cannot give a physical material location to it. But the primary locus of interaction for the soul is the area of the heart. So the soul interacts by sending consciousness. Consciousness is the energy of the soul. Just like if you have a bulb over here. From the bulb, light is coming out. Stream of light is coming out. The soul is like the bulb. And the light coming out from the soul is like consciousness. So the consciousness radiates out through the body, all over the body, and through the body to the outer world also. That's why I said there is an inner seer, so the inner seer is the soul. The consciousness radiating out of the soul comes to the inner screen, and from the inner screen it goes out to the outer scene. The soul 
is situ is connected with the body and its locus of interaction with the body is through the area of the heart radiating outward to the body and the physical world okay. yeah yeah Yeah, that's the that's the second third point. I'm going to come to that. Yeah. Sir, what is the difference? What is the dif or connection between desire and thoughts? Okay. What is the connection between desire and thoughts? This will require some thought. <laughs> so, what we mean by that is, again, uh, words can have different meanings in different contexts. So, let's put it this way: that thought refers to a stream appearing, a stream of images or a stream of uh, words appearing on our inner screen. Now, when that stream appears, it is just there. Just like a particular link is there. Mm -hmm. So if we are reading a particular news and then we see a link over there. Mm -hmm. If some there's a link says that racist attack on Indians, oh, we might get alarmed. What happened? We might want to, we, reading that itself might agitate us a little bit. So it triggers a particular emotion within us. So the, the interaction of the stream of stimuli on the inner screen with consciousness, that produces certain emotions. <clears throat> so one particular reaction could be anger, other could be fear, other could be surprise, other could be shock. So overall, desire is you could say the next stage resulting from thought thought is more of uh, more of passive observation desire is where motion comes into it so when we we get emotionally involved in a particular stream that is going on in our consciousness that is when thought transforms into emotion or desire now desire uh, again emotion and desire is a, the difference could be technical but broadly we could say Emotion, uh, when desire is something, okay, I want to do this, I want to get this. When we get emotionally involved in the sense of wanting something, that is where desire comes up. But attention given to thoughts makes, makes some emotional involvement in it. And that emotional involvement is where uh, desire is a possible product of that emotional involvement. Desire can be one product, anger can be another product. So like that, there can be different... Uh, uh, results of emotional involvement with thoughts. Okay. Yeah. So now let's move on to the so the first point was that our thoughts are neither the way th not necessarily they could be but not necessarily the way things are or we are thoughts are primarily streams of images or words in our inner screen. Now the second point I'll talk about is checking the thoughts. Now the word check can have two meanings again. Check can mean evaluate. And check can mean regulate. Mm -hmm. So check the flow, check the flow of people into the temple. That means, okay, you know, too many, there's much, too much crowd here, decrease it. That's regulate. But check, so all the luggage will have to be checked before it enters the flight. Check doesn't mean that stop, but check means evaluate. So check can mean both regulate and evaluate. So when we want to check our thoughts, so basically <clears throat> when something appears on our inner screen, at that time, if we just identify with it and we start getting carried away by it, we get involved in it. It's like say, like a, say a link we see somewhere while we are reading something on the, on the computer, we see a link or sometimes it's not just a link, sometimes there's a pop-up window. It just comes up quite big. When it comes up, if you look at it, and if we are not very alert about what we are doing, if you are not very aware, then we just click on it. And then it opens up. And then we get involved in it. Sometimes some people just decide, okay, I'm going to watch YouTube video for five minutes. But at five minutes, may become five hours. Why? Because we become, we get caught in the whatever is coming on that screen. So for us to check our th check the thoughts or check what is appearing on our inner screen, what can we do? See, broadly speaking, for us, the more self-observant we become, 
That means the more we are vigilant in, and first of all, if you just get the knowledge that my thoughts can often mislead me, so I have to observe and evaluate my thoughts. That knowledge itself can make us a little more alert. <coughs> Say, if there's a clean page where there are no distractions, we can read care, we can just read, focus on reading. But if you know there is a page with lots of ads and lots of pop-ups, then we have to be careful that I don't click on something and I'll get distracted. So one of the best ways to, they say that if you don't want to get distracted, internet addiction is also a big problem nowadays for people. So one of the ways, one of the primary ways is a, it's a recommended for dealing with internet addiction is purposeful browsing. Purposeful browsing means before you open the internet, have your purpose clearly in mind. For the next 15 minutes, I want to read this particular article. Or for the next 10 minutes, I want to check the news. Or be very clear about the purpose. So if we are purposeful, we won't get distracted. But if we are just bored, let me find something interesting. And then I go on the internet. Okay, this doesn't seem interesting. Maybe that will be interesting. Maybe that will be interesting. That will be interesting. So if we are purposeless, then we will be swept by anything. It's like, in a way, in an ocean, if a boat doesn't have any direction where it is going, then whichever way, is it, whichever way the waves come, it will go in that direction. So, to check our thoughts, first of all, we need to have a purpose. It's just like, right now, if you want to concentrate on hearing what is going on in this class, then even if there is some noise here, some noise there, even if, say, your the thighs start feeling, hey, it's not comfortable sitting on the ground, maybe you feel it's a little cold over here, but okay, this class is not going to go forever, I can tolerate this. So that comes in that, it pops up, but we don't pay attention to it. So the most important thing for checking our thoughts is purpose. If we are purposeful, if we, if we are purposeless, then we will, get, we will become powerless against the mind. Whatever thought comes up, we'll get carried away by that. So for checking our thoughts, we need some reference point against which to check it. Okay, this is what I wanted to do, and but I'm not doing this. Uh, this is what I don't want. So if we are if we are purposeless, we become powerless against the mind. Whatever the mind shows, we get carried away by it. And so for checking the thoughts, first of all, having a purpose is important. Now purpose doesn't mean that we always have to be busy running about, but we have to be purposeful. What am I doing? So generally there are three questions which we can ask ourselves to become purposeful. It's simple questions, but periodically if we ask ourselves, what am I doing? Why am I doing? How am I doing? Whenever we start getting lost in our thoughts, what am I doing? Okay, say, okay, I am sitting here, here in this class on the Bhagavad Gita. <coughs> Why am I doing this? Okay, I want to learn about the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, or maybe it could be, I want to learn about myself, I want to learn about human psychology, I want to learn about my own mind, whatever it is. Why am I doing this? And how am I doing it? Okay, you know I was sitting attentively but now I am sprawling on the back, I have become a little inattentive, let me focus. So these simple questions like this to ourselves, that can help us to become more aware. So what am I doing? I might say, okay, I was here in the Bhagavad Gita class, but I suddenly remembered that, okay, suddenly a thought came, did I lock my home? Or if I didn't lock my home, will some thief come in? And I got lost. Oh, actually there's security at my home, I don't have to worry about it. So when we become more, when we learn to introspect, so the, these questions, this kind of self-awareness is very helpful. So to check our thoughts, what am I doing? Why am I doing? How am I doing? These three questions can help us to get, become purposeful. So first point I said is, for checking our thoughts is purposefulness. Hmm. Second is, after being purposeful, we ask ourselves self-orienting questions. Okay, where am I, am I going off track? Am I coming on track? And then beyond that, <clears throat> it is good to identify typical kinds of distractions that our mind comes up with. So if, we, we are, if, we, if we are regularly visiting some sites, then we, after some time we come to know, okay, this particular link, this shows some video, it is just a, it is just a lying link as they see. 
it shows something cap it just like a click bait it doesn't go anywhere contrast interesting mm -hmm. so when <coughs> that happens at that time we don't pay attention to it oh this is a lying link so all of us may have So, so when we have certain links, which are, so if in our mind, we know that there are certain kind of thought patterns which agitate us, which distract us, which typically keep coming within us. Say for example, all of us may have, some of us may have a habitual tendency to feel lonely. So if we call someone, I, I one of my friends in America, Mm, is a the word for it is suicide intervention counselor somebody is about to commit suicide and then they think maybe I should not so they call and then he has to talk with them so he tells me sometimes people there's such, such trivial reasons they might do that he said there was one girl she she committed suicide and then she called not her ghost called but rather she took the pills and then she called and then they, they, were, they rushed an ambulance and they saved her. And they asked her, why did she call? Why did she commit suicide? And then the answer she gave was, that she was in a relationship with a boy. And she called that boy. And that boy didn't pick up her call. And we say, what ridiculous this? Say, somebody doesn't pick up your phone call. Why do you, why do you commit suicide by that? But you know, though, what happens is, that based on that particular incident, a particular impression comes up. A particular impression popped up. Maybe she was unloved in her childhood. Maybe she felt that, okay, okay, he's picked up, he's not picked up my phone call. That means he doesn't love me anymore. Maybe he's already with someone else. Maybe he has ditched me. Oh, maybe I'm going to be alone. Oh, this person left me. Maybe other people will also leave me. I will always be alone in my life. Everybody will have pity on me, seeing me alone all the time. What is the use of such a pitiable life? Let me end my life. So you can see how one stimulus can trigger a whole movie over there. And that movie can, from one unanswered phone call, you can become a suicidal. So if somebody has that fear of abandonment or fear of inferiority, or say fear of loneliness. So our minds delude us in particular ways. So that means some stimuli can typically start off a particular train of thoughts, a particular set of images. So when we identify that, so when we understand this, then we identify that instead of identifying with that. What do I mean by identify that instead of identifying with that? That means that, oh, as soon as we start, so I say, we, we try to talk with someone and that person just cuts us off and goes away. And then we start feeling, oh, nobody cares for me, nobody will care for me. So that is the, we could call this the loneliness movie of the mind. Oh, that is the loneliness movie starting. Or we could say some, some people, some people just, you know, they have spoken badly, they have, done, they have dealt something badly with us and we are very angry with them. So as soon as it starts off, now the anger movie is starting. So identify that. Identify means give a name to that. So this is the movie starting. So now, as soon as we understand this is the movie starting, then we can, okay, do I want to watch this movie? No. This is, this is not a good movie to watch. It will simply get me into trouble. I don't want to watch it. So whatever our typical thought patterns are, we need to identify that. So we are eating some food and then, Many times we eat some food and then we eat some more food and then we eat some more food. And then our stomach starts paining, we start getting angry with ourselves. Why did I eat so much? So when that starts off, when we have eaten and a part of us knows, okay, you have eaten enough now. But then something says, come on, let's eat a little more. So then if that is the tendency to which we fall repeatedly, you can say, okay, now that is the overeating script starting. The mind overeating script. Oh, okay. Now I don't want to. Read. I don't want to hear this. I don't want to watch this. I don't want to be a part of this. So giving a name 
to the typical thought patterns that are my thought pattern that with which our mind deludes us that is very helpful and if we just observe ourselves we'll find that it's not that the mind deludes us with infinite number of thought patterns it could possibly there are infinite number of thoughts which could come in the mind but the thoughts which grow they grow along uh, regularly regularly traveled channels so there are certain channels which tend to open up quickly in our consciousness. So if we identify them, then we, if, then we won't identify with them. We don't get carried away with them. I don't need to watch this. I don't need to watch this. So another thing which we could do in general, this is not always possible, but to check the, check the thoughts that we are getting, attribute each thought first to the mind. That means, as soon as we start, say, I'm feeling angry. When you start feeling angry, instead of just say, the mind is saying, I'm feeling angry. Just attribute each thought to the mind. Now, that doesn't mean we neglect it. Sometimes there might be genuine reason for anger also. But sometimes it might just be an overreaction. So, by attributing like this, we can check. Now, is, this, is it worth getting angry? It's not really worth it. Maybe it's not worth getting uh, the, now, now I don't want to get distracted. I'll deal with this afterwards. I want to do something important. So just speaking in, uh, to ourselves here softly on the mind, the mind is saying, say for example, right now, this class is becoming too technical. <laughs> okay. Now what may happen, the, if, if you just say the class is becoming too technical, I, I can't understand this. And by saying that, you might tune off all completely. But if you say the class is becoming too technical, too an the class is becoming too analytical. Okay, the mind is saying, the mind is saying the class is becoming too analytical. Okay, but you know, this is interesting analysis. This is something which I ex experience also all the time. So you could respond to it. Sometimes you fail. Yeah, it is too too analytical. I can't understand this. But sometimes it might be that you okay, it's analytical, but it's helpful. It's stimulating. So the point is when we we can verbalize it. We can just attribute it, uh, articulate it and attribute it. The mind is saying, this is becoming too technical, it's becoming too analytical. Okay. Yeah, I agree, it's analytical. So what do I do about it? You can actually think and engage and evaluate. So that's how we can check our thoughts. So I broadly talked about, this was the second point I was going to make, learning to check our thoughts. And in that I talked about five broad strategies. <coughs> First is uh, <clears throat> just becoming more and more, in, and having the knowledge to be, uh, having this whole knowledge by which we can evaluate ourselves. Second is per being always purposeful. Third is having self-awareness questions. What am I doing? Why am I doing? How am I doing? Periodically asking ourselves. So that when we are purposeful, when we go off track, we can be aware of it. Fourth was uh, identifying typical thought patterns within us. So, and last was attributing thoughts first to the mind so that we can evaluate them. So this was the second point, check, learning to check our thoughts. So any questions or comments about this? That's true. So, when, if we, when sometimes consciously get carried away, even if we identify, that doesn't necessarily mean we'll be able to rectify it. So, but identifying is the beginning. At least we understand where the problem is. See, if you know if your house is being robbed, but you don't know where the thief is coming from, then what do you do? If the house keeps getting robbed. But at least you come to know where the thief is coming from, that does not necessarily stop the thief. But at least you're not yet caught the thief, you're not yet got the goods back, but at least you know where the thief is coming from. So this is not necessarily the complete solution, but it's at least an understanding of where the problem is. Okay. So I'll move to the last point now. The last point is that changing our thoughts. Changing our thoughts is, so uh, this is where 
the process of bhakti yoga comes into the picture so krishna in the 14th chapter talks about becoming an observer of our thoughts <coughs> and being an observer of our thoughts that's what he tells in 14.22 23 but later on 14.26 he says maam chayo abhyavicharena bhakti yogena sevate sagunan samati tyaitan brahma bhuyaya kalpate he says you just practice bhakti to me you will become purified you will become spiritualized so what this means is that those of us who tend to live a lot in our thoughts who tend to be analytical the preceding analysis can be helpful to deal with that over analytical nature to understand how i am over analyzing but some people may not have that analytical nature at all so for them as well as for those in the preceding category bhakti what it does see if as i said if we had a completely clean screen but there's no distraction then we could just focus on reading what we need to read so so what we do by practicing bhakti yoga bhakti yoga is the process by which we clean the inner screen so when we chant the holy names of krishna when we worship krishna by doing puja when we do our sadhana bhakti regularly we are bringing krishna a uh, krishna is a higher spiritual reality but we are bringing krishna into our outer scene and into our inner screen and if we keep bringing krishna over there the krishna krishna surya sama maya hai andaka krishna is like light darkness cannot stay in his presence so when we bring krishna repeatedly into our inner screen by that gradually the unwanted or unhealthy uh, 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 links will themselves get driven out sometimes you have a app if you you have a if you have say google chrome browser there's some extension which just clean up the screen so all the ads and everything goes off and all that you can see is what you want to read so like that krishna is when we bring krishna into our consciousness then gradually everything else that is distracting starts going out so uh, changing the content of the screen means that it's primarily we try to bring krishna as much as possible on the screen of our consciousness the more we bring krishna on that screen the more uh, we will start getting a clearer perspective of things so that doesn't does that mean that we stop thinking about everything else no that is not the point so we have to bhakti has two aspects to it i'll conclude with this point that bhakti has a world transcending aspect and a world transforming aspect so world transcending means just go beyond this world think of a higher reality the world is a place where there is always distress and uh, distraction just don't think about it there is a world transcending aspect but that is not the only aspect of bhakti bhakti also has a world transforming aspect so for example when we are doing our when we try to sit and hear some philosophy or hear krishna's past times or when we come and take darshan when we do our meditation all these times we are engaging in which aspect of bhakti what do you think these are all which are world transcending or world transforming transforming no these are transcending we are not thinking about the world at all isn't it so these are world transcending aspects so okay there are so many things happening in my life but i don't want to think about any of these things let me think about krishna right so the world transcending aspect of bhakti is one aspect which is very important but some people think this is all that bhakti is but it is not like that shila prabhupada was in vrindavan and he was completely practicing the world transcending aspect of bhakti he was he had retired from his family life he was reading about krishna writing about krishna speaking about krishna he could have stayed over there but from there shila prabhupada came to america to the western world and he traveled across the world why because his purpose is not just to transcend the world but also to transform the world so in our case we need some daily time when we can transcend the world when we can become absorbed in krishna so that is the time we could say if we can connect ourselves with krishna if we can get absorbed in krishna it's like our inner screen cleans up hmm? our inner screen cleans up if we do our sadhana well uh, then we will find that we will have some calmness and clarity and confidence that will stay with us throughout our day 
so that if that clean screen is there again some unwanted links will keep coming up but they won't stay there immediately they won't be there constantly they won't be stay there constantly so <clears throat> if we have a healthy balance of both <coughs> the world transcending and the world transforming so we engage in the world because we want to function we want to do things here we have family we have responsibilities we have aspirations we also want to do practical service to krishna in the world so that is also required and when the screen is cleaned then we can focus more and do whatever whatever we are purposeful about we can do better if the screen is clean so we could say practicing bhakti is like cleaning this one aspect of or rather the the sadhana bhakti aspect of bhakti is like cleaning the screen and then practically acting in the world whether it is our professional jobs our family responsibilities or our services in the temple whatever we are doing practically that is more like acting world transforming so we need a healthy balance of the world transcending and the world transforming if we think only of world transforming and we don't clean our inner world then over a period of time our bhakti our seva will become like work for us okay i do that work there i come to temple and i do this work we will not the spiritual element in our consciousness will go down so we need to have healthy amount of time for the world transcending aspect but if we focus only on the world transcending and then don't do any world transforming aspect that means we don't do anything practical we will just become impractical otherworldly and because we have energy we have potentials we will be we will eventually feel dissatisfied so bhakti has both these aspects but by the practice of bhakti yoga by bringing krishna on our inner screen we will clean the inner screen and by cleaning that inner screen we will be able to function better so sometimes we feel i don't have time to practice bhakti i have so many things to do i have got is this this there is this, this see all of us have lots of things to do there, there there is everyone is busy but we have to understand that our time is not taken just by our activities our time is taken also by our thoughts by our thoughts say suppose you have some some important meeting in your office and you go for that meeting and while that meeting is going on some colleague uh insults you or speaks negatively about you now that might just happen within 10 seconds 30 seconds but that just gets lodged in your consciousness how dare this person speak like this about me and then that might actually take hours and hours of your time why do they speak like sometimes we we go into a party and then or we go to get together and some we greet someone and that person snubs us now the snub might happen in 10 seconds but for the next 10 hours revenge fantasies are going on within <laughs> next time in front of everybody i will snub that person so now that in our schedule it might we might still be there in the party we might be reading we might be talking with people it's just an activity but in all those activities we are not involved properly we are distracted because of that one thought so our active our time is taken not just by the by the activities it's also taken by thoughts so when we practice bhakti what will happen is we may feel it's one more activity to do but this is a activity that will clean out the distracting thoughts if if we are practice if we are practicing bhakti we connect with krishna we have that security no i am eternally the part of krishna krishna always loves me and my real life is in my relationship with krishna and my service to krishna then even if somebody snubs us we don't take that so seriously even if somebody insults us okay different people have different opinions no we will become thick skinned don't take that so seriously we may deal with it appropriately but we won't get carried away by it so when the link pops up like you said sometimes link comes up comes up and it opens up so fast that we can't do anything about it but when we practice bhakti the power of those links on us the power of them to open up very rapidly that decreases and thus actually speaking all the bhakti activities take time the activities of bhakti take time but the activities of bhakti save the time that is taken away by stray thoughts and in that sense 
we'll find that although we have less time, we'll be able to do more in that less time. If you're practicing sadhana well, even what earlier might take us three hours to do, we'll be able to do it in one hour. Because the distracting thoughts have become lesser. We can focus more. So in that sense, to th we, we need to think that, oh, I don't have time for bhakti. You make some time for bhakti and you'll find that you will be able to actually dis decrease your distraction and whatever other things we have to do, we'll be able to do it in lesser time with greater quality. So bhakti is not just another to-do in our to-do list. Bhakti is another way to do our to-do list. <laughs> bhakti is another way. Why another way? Because while we are doing, why did I got up? We are doing one thing. We are worried. Oh, that thing I didn't do so well. And we are, what about the next thing? How am I going to do it? So like that, each thing we do, but we do distractedly. But when we are we are purified by a connection with Krishna, we'll do each thing at, as attentively as we can. So we'll. It's another way to do our whole to-do list. It's a, it's a way by which we are more focused and wholehearted in whatever we do. And thus we can be more effective in every walk of our lives. So, by, so I'll summarize, I spoke on the topic of thinking about thinking. How our thoughts may harm us or help us. And I talked three points. First was that our thoughts are not necessarily the way things are or the way we are. Our thoughts are simply streams of words or images on our inner screen. I talked about this three-level reality. If somebody is uh, in a, sec a security in charge in a control room for a building with five gates, five doors. So that person is like the soul who is the inner seer, the screen on which all the uh, camera inputs are coming. That's like the mind. And the physical reality is out there. So the soul is the root of consciousness and the mind is the route of consciousness. So when people start going insane, then they start taking the inner screen too seriously, more than the outer screen also. So for us, what appears on the inner screen is determined not just by the, not just by the perceptions from outside, but also by the impressions from inside. And sometimes those impressions may trigger certain start of certain movies which may distract us completely. So, so the mind, if it starts playing too negative a movie, it can even lead a person to kill themselves. So the inner screen is not just some theoretical concept. The inner screen is very consequential in our daily lives. Then I talked about checking the content of our mind, checking our thoughts. And for that I talked about five things. Just the knowledge. Okay, there is this inner screen and these thoughts are not necessarily real. <laughs> so having that knowledge helps. Then second is being purposeful. Like in purposeful browsing, we won't get distracted by various links. So always having some purpose. What am I doing? So purposefulness helps. And then we can have self, uh, self -orient reorientation. I talk about three questions. What am I doing? Why am I doing? How am I doing? <coughs> and then I talked about identifying typical thought patterns and giving them a name. Oh, that is a loneliness movie starting. That is a resentment movie starting. Now that is the overeating movie starting. So that way we can, and then fifth was, whenever any disorienting thought comes up, attribute that thought first to the mind. I am feeling angry. The mind is saying, I am feeling angry. And then the third part I talked about, after not just checking the content, checking our thoughts, but changing our thoughts. Talked about bringing Krishna onto our inner screen. By practicing the activities of Bhakti Yoga, we bring Krishna into our outer scene and we bring him into our inner screen. And Krishna becomes like the screen cleaner. He is all pure and everything impure and distracting will gradually start going away. And as it goes away, we will be able to function more effectively. So, uh, although it may seem like the activities of Sadhana Bhakti take time, the, the Bhakti has two aspects to it, the world transcending and the world transforming. So we withdraw from the world and focus exclusively on Krishna so that our consciousness gets cleaned by that. And then after that, we engage in the world in a mood of service to Krishna. So although the world transcending aspects of Bhakti takes extra time for us, but it's not just another to-do. 
because this to do will clean our inner screen and our time is taken not just by our things to do but also by our thoughts and those distracting thoughts can take hours and hours of our time without ever appearing on our schedule at all so if we can clean out those thoughts then even if we have lesser time we'll be able to do more because we'll be more focused so bhakti is not just another to do uh, in our to do list but rather it is another way to do our to do list thank you very much hare krishna <laughs> so should we stop or do we have time for questions Take Is there any question? Yes. Anyone has? Yes, yeah. Yes, Swami. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So, if I have understood this correctly, um, you said that there is a thought, and then there can be an emotion or a feeling. Correct. Behind it. So, how do you explain attachment, especially attachment for your own children? Is that a thought that comes, or is it inborn in you? It just is there when you uh, conceive a child. Okay. So does thought, if I say thought leads to emotion, when you get involved in attachment to our children, how does it come? See, for all of us, there are certain functional patterns of thinking that are vital for our survival. And say, if good say, for the survival of our race. See, if I touch this now, while I'm talking with you, and then suddenly the electric current, I feel it. Immediately my hand will move away. I don't really think about it at that time. There is some sense of alarm and there's instinct. So there are many things which happen within us which are, which are essential for our survival, but they are, you could say, like programmed instincts. So similarly, for the propagation of the human race, or for that matter, any species, now, the, the parents have to have some natural attachment towards their progeny. Otherwise, all the sacrifice that is needed for taking care of a progeny can't do it. So, it comes naturally. So, when, they, when there is, when we could say when there is attachment. So, it's like th the distance between thought, emotion, action becomes very less. A thought, emotion, action, when there is a lot of, when either there is a lot of attachment, or anyway, attachment is a generally negative word. When there's a lot of investment of our emotion in something, it could be positive also. It's important also. Say, if somebody is a nurse in a hospital and they hear that somebody is triggered, the, uh, triggered a bell, they got a, somebody's got a heart attack, cardiac arrest, then they all run immediately. And that there are trained instincts over there. They run over there. Okay, you get this, you get this, you get this, and immediately they work. So basically, if we are invested in something, then thoughts, emotions, actions all work together very quickly. And up, in one sense, training means that only. That we should be able to work very fast. A trained firefighter, when they see a fire, they immediately, oh, fire, okay, what should I do? This, 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 okay, attack the fire from here, you attack from there, you attack from there. So training means that in a particular healthy way, the thoughts, emotions and actions move very quickly together. So, in the case of attach, attachment, the word has a negative connotation. But I would say, especially for a parent to have towards a child, especially a newborn child, it's affection. It's vital. But as the child grows up, if one starts becoming too attached, then it can become a problem. Where one feels too... too attachment can go in two ways. One is... We try to over control the person because we are so attached to them or attachment can also mean that we become more concerned about what they think about us than about them. So Dhritarashtra's attachment was the second type. Dhritarashtra was he could never tolerate in any way displeasing Duryodhana and that's why he did whatever Duryodhana said. So this is the natural mechanism which is there for us. The so parents should have the affection to their children. But it can misfire at times. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, you know, the mind. Yeah. Uh, we can read the mind, we can control the mind, we are <coughs> aware of the mind. Now, when you say mind and soul, we are not aware of the soul. You say it's a semi physical, it's not a physical thing. So, if the soul is there, how do we know 
how do we control it? Is it is residing within, or does it also travel outside inside? Actually, we can we say we can control the mind, but how can we become aware of the soul or control the soul? Actually, the capacity to be aware of even the mind comes from the soul. The soul is who you are. The soul is, if we try to look for the soul, it is what we are looking for is what we are looking with. What we are looking for is what we are looking with. So, the soul can never be seen because the soul is the seer. Now, the soul can be inferred. Inferred. Inf inferences can be made about the existence of the soul. See, if, if we suppose there, if we never had any mirror anywhere, if imagine a world where there was no reflecting object at all, then we would never see ourselves. How would we even say, if there were no reflecting object, we would never be able to see ourselves. So the soul, so the seer cannot see themselves without some reflecting object. So now with respect to this, with respect to the soul, the seer is spiritual. And that's why no material or reflecting object will show it. But what we can do is there can be an inference made about it. That okay, in moments of a special calmness, say so if you are calm, you can actually notice your thoughts this is a thought experiment when i do this seminar in corporate i do a thought experiment i'll just explain it briefly because it will take a few moments say suppose somebody close your eyes and then try to see what you see in front of you maybe it'll just take a minute you can do it all of you can just close your eyes for a minute and take three deep breaths Now, with your eyes closed, look at what you see in front of you. Because your eyes are closed, you cannot see what is physically in front of you. But still, there is some kind of screen inside you on which you can see various things. You may see this room, you may see your home, you may see your car, you may see a friend, you may see a loud one, you may see your phone, or you may see a series of images coming and going over there. Or you might just see a <coughs> dull uh, haze of colors over there. But whatever it is that you see, you see it on some kind of screen inside you. Now while you are looking at that screen, try to take a step backwards and catch sight of who is looking at that screen. I repeat, while looking at the screen, try to take a step back and catch sight of who is the seer of that screen. You try once again. Try to see the seer of that screen. No matter how many times you try to step back, the seer steps back with you. Because you are the seer. You, the seer, is the soul. And the screen on which various things are seen, that is the mind. You can take one deep breath and you can open your eyes. So the seer of everything, the drashta, that is the mind, that is the soul. And this, the very fact that we are able to see indicates that there has to be a seer. <coughs> so the soul cannot be seen, but the soul can be inferred. Like this with this exercise, you understand. There is a screen, but there has to be a seer, although I cannot spot the seer. That seer of the outer scene and seer of the inner screen is the soul. Does it travel outside, the soul's consciousness can travel outside. The soul's consciousness can leave the body and go away also. There are people who have outer body experiences. There are outer body projections. The soul, as I said, uh, the, you have to understand the soul is not necessarily physically located in the body itself. It's like I may have my computer. And I might go to office and my, from office, I can control my computer also. There are remote devices by which I can, can control our machine from remote places also. So, the user is not situated in the machine. The distance of the user from the machine may not always matter for controlling the machine. So, the soul normally does not leave the body. The soul is associated with the body for one lifetime. And when we die, then the soul leaves this body and goes to another body. That's how transmigration happens. But occasionally, in exceptional situation, the soul can 
conceivably project its consciousness elsewhere and become temporarily disconnected from the body. Okay. So thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada ki